We're live from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club for the eighth anniversary week-to-week -week political roundtable program. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you for braving the coronavirus and, and showing up. We appreciate that. <laughs> you know, we have a lot to discuss today, and certainly we'll get into the uh, presidential primaries and caucuses, which have finally started. Um, some of the candidates on the Democratic side and their supporters have complained that the debate qualification rules have been tweaked to the advantage of former New York mayor and current New York zillionaire Mike Bloomberg to get him into these debates. And it's true. The new rules have kept frozen the level of, uh, uh, what was it, the polling minimums that they needed, and that helped Mike Bloomberg. Um, however, the other qualifications, I don't think you can really say that. I mean, you know, you have to get at least one delegate from a previous primary, anyone can do that. And you have to have at least $43 billion in the bank. I mean, <laughs> go to your 401k, folks, you can do it. Anyway, I'm John Zipper, your humble host for the Week to Week Political Roundtable. On tonight's program, we will discuss the latest from the Trump administration. That will take about four days. And then we'll talk about the corruption scandal here in San Francisco, the 2020 race, and more. And of course, we'll send you off with our live news quiz. Um, everyone, of course, is welcome at the Commonwealth Club. Doesn't matter what your views are. So any opinions that are expressed up here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. I'm going to start at the far end of the stage with Carla Marinucci, senior writer at Politico California Playbook. You. you can find her online at C Marinucci on Twitter. Next to her is Tim Miller. He is the founder of Light Fuse Communications. He's a contributor to The Bulwark. He was the communications director for Jeb Bush 2016. He's the founder of America Rising. You can find him on Twitter at Tim ODC or Team ODC. Watch so, out. <laughs> Fire beware. Welcome back. And next to me is Melissa Kane. She's a political analyst. She's a lawyer and a frequent moderator right here at the Commonwealth Club. So welcome back, Melissa. Thank you for me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we have a lot of returned uh, uh, audience members here today. So you know how we do this. There are question cards spread throughout the room. Write out some questions, send them up, especially during the first half. During the second half, uh, I often will run out of time. Um, but also do me, do me a favor, feel free to write on the card the person you want to win the primary, the presidential primary on March 3rd. <laughs> Seriously, whether you're Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter, there's no wrong answer. Do they have to be running? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say there's no wrong answer. So you can answer write John, Z Williamson. John Zipperer. You can write that. <laughs> I loved Marianne. Sorry. <laughs> she was, she she was been a the, big upgrade. She was the uh, <laughs> official spirit animal of week to week. But anyway, she's gone. Um, so let's get into our first topic, and that is President Trump. Uh, President Donald Trump has apparently survived his first impeachment. In the days since he was acquitted, <laughs> President Trump had made it clear he's not going to change his behavior, it's just to avoid future legal jeopardy. So let's start with the news that broke today. He issued a number of pardons. Uh, yes. <laughs> He uh, issued a the sentence of former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, one of the most enjoyable corruption scandals <laughs> of the past right. decade. Um, but he also pardoned former 49ers owner Ed Bartolo Jr. Ed applause. Ed okay, we're, in, we're in 49ers <laughs> land here. As well as financier Michael Milken and former New York Police Commissioner Bernie Carrick. No fans of them? Okay, fine. Wow. <laughs> Tim, what are your thoughts on the president's pardons, and are they sending a message? Uh, for sure. Uh, the president called my people, the anti-Trump Republicans, human scum, but uh, Bernie Carrick is human scum. The people <laughs> he pardoned today were the real humans, a lot of them, not, maybe not Eddie D. I, I didn't know all the detail. I, Carlo was briefing me in the back on, the, on Eddie D's uh, uh, crimes from the past. That one didn't seem like quite as outrageous as some of the other pardons today. But look, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, one of the pardons was a, uh, uh, a, their kid was a big donor to the campaign. Obviously, we know uh, Governor Blagojevich was on uh, Celebrity Apprentice, so uh, Apprentice Contestant Pardoned. That was an <laughs> Onion headline, actually, in the early <laughs> 2000s that ever. it came real uh, today. And, and of course, it, look, it's a message to, you know, Stone and Manafort to hang in there. It's a message to other, you know, future uh, 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 people with access to power, people with access to the Fox News green room that they, that they could be part in two or their friends could be. And, um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. Uh, he's not the first president to make bad pardons. Um, uh, frankly, you know, the thing that really got me riled up 
you know, internally that really got my blood pressure going after, uh, after the impeachment was, was less the pardons and, and more you know, his treatment of the people that testified against him, like Colonel Vindman. Yeah. I mean, Al Alex Vindman, uh, like, I'm sure many of the people here are follow this closely, but for those that don't, one that was a recipient of the Purple Heart. Uh, he still has shrapnel in his butt from uh, service over in Iraq. Um, he he did nothing wrong. He did not uh, speak out against the president. He didn't leak despite accusations. All he did, the only time he's spoken at all to the media was when he was subpoenaed and had to testify uh, in front of Congress. Uh, and to have him and his brother, for no, who did nothing, uh, <laughs> perp walked out of the White House by security. Um, I just was absolutely astonishing. And I think that, that the message that was sent from that um, was heard loud and clear, and it wasn't somebody that, that actually cares about service to the country, but cares about service to him. And, um, and, and it's a message that I think is being taken inside the White House, and slowly but surely, the types of people that went there to serve the country, and maybe in spite of disagreements with the president, are, are either being pushed out or are leaving, and, and that's not a good sign, especially if he's around for five more years. Carla? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, I wonder if the pardon fest today was sort of an effort to get attention off uh, uh, the Attorney General and the kind of criticism uh, I, that I he's facing. I do want facing. to get into that as yeah, well, yes. Yeah, yeah, the kind of criticism he's facing. I mean, uh, look, uh, President Trump landed here in California about an hour and a half ago in L.A., uh, and he was uh, slamming California uh, as he landed and its leadership in San Francisco and Los Angeles on homeless issues. He's talking about immigration. He's going to have with him uh, one of the people he had at the, at the State of the Union address whose brother was killed by an undocumented immigrant from, from California here. So, uh, you know, as we talk about what he's doing back in D.C. with the pardons and with Barr, uh, there's no question that coming out here, he's planning on, uh, he's got his own agenda, which is kind of running against California. Uh, which, which we're going to continue to see uh, during this re-election. Uh, it, it it's a thing that gins up his base. It gives him a chance to talk about uh, homelessness and other issues and point to California as this uh, outlier. His, his, secretary, his uh, director of um, um, domestic policy today uh, tweeted that Trump is in occupied territory in California. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's what we are, the nation's most populous state. So uh, with that said, I mean, it's going to be interesting to watch the next couple of days. Uh, by the way, if you want to play around a golf with um, President Trump and have a picture taken with him, it'll cost you $250,000 uh, down at Larry Ellison's place in Rancho Mirage. <laughs> Man of the people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, so um, also, though, if you look at Rob Blagojevich, for example, a Democrat... I just yeah. want to remind, I know no one wants to claim it, but yeah, <laughs> he is. He was. Uh, his wife was really, um, I mean, he, you know, he owes her everything because she has been relentless in trying to get him released since he was sent to jail. And one of the things that she did was to go on Fox News, as you alluded to, and say, my husband is the victim of the same thing you're a victim of, President Trump. It's this deep state FBI conjured, um, you know, illegality that my husband's being is, is the victim of. And now I'm watching the president being impeached and, and being investigated. And it's very, very similar. He's just like you. And so there was this real, does, real effort to really tie what happened to Blagojevich to what happened to uh, President Trump with regard to those kind of investigations. So that may be tying in a little bit to how he's um, now that he feels somewhat vindicated by not being removed from office, although he was impeached, uh, sort of, uh, you know, trying to undo some of the injustice that it, that some other people are, are alleging happened. And I'll tell you, you just can't buy publicity like Jerry Rice in the Oval Office with like, thanks, President Trump. You know, I mean, like that was that's a heck of a photo op that he managed with the DeBartolo pardon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that was, you know, you, you can expect that'll be something as he's coming to California that, uh, you know, is very prominent in his uh, Twitter timeline. And, there. I, and kind of sad, like, so I kind of agree with the Bogoyevich point. I mean, some of these pardons on the merits we're fine. I, you know, in mean, 14 years for Blagojevich, is, that's a lot of time. You know? And so the, the problem is, that is when you, know, you need to have Jerry Rice or Kim Kardashian on your side to get a pardon mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. this president. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's not somebody who's showing that they actually really care about equal justice under the law, but they you know, care about celebrities sucking up to them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you've got what, the African-American woman in Texas who voted 
uh, on parole, and she's, what, five years uh, yeah. she got that's for that? That's crazy. Right, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have to wonder if, you know, this eventually plays in. How, how's it playing with just average folks out there uh, to see, you know, the friends of, of Trump uh, get, get the pardons and not sort of just average people, or a lot of average people out there? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the Vindman's brothers, as uh, Tim mentioned, getting... Uh, ousted from their positions. Uh, there was also a U.S. attorney, Jesse Liu, who uh, had been nominated, I guess, for a yeah. Treasury Department role. She had overseen the Roger Stone case, uh, and President Trump dropped her nomination. Um, so it does seem kind of a across the board, both from matters of, like, with some of these pardons, just trying to score some points, as well as really get across some message of, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, we uh, mentioned the Justice Department and Attorney General Bill Barr. Um, perhaps that was the biggest dust up since the acquittal. And, and this involves, uh, let's see, when former Trump, what do we call him? <laughs> Friend, consulary, <laughs> um, <laughs> fixer, whatever, Roger Stone. Uh, his sentence was in the offing, and Trump took to the Twitter sphere to complain about the uh, recommended, the prosecutor's recommended uh, uh, sentence for him. I think it was seven years? Yes, right. <coughs> seven to nine. Seven to nine. And uh, very quickly, the Justice Department recommended something less. Um, Attorney General Bill Barr said last Thursday that Trump's Twitter attacks made it impossible to do his job at the, at the Justice Department, said it's time to stop the tweeting, Trump responded by saying, quote, as far as interfering with Justice Department investigations, the president responded by saying, this doesn't mean that I do not have, as president, the legal right to do so. I do, but I have so far chosen not to, unquote. Um, <laughs> Melissa he does have the power to do a lot of this stuff, doesn't he? I mean, has he actually, as far as you know, broken the law in any of this? Well, I mean, he can, he can say, and I'm sure he would, that he has a First Amendment right to express his opinion about you know, whether the length of the sentence is, is this or that, but, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so he might say, you know, that, that's what he's talking about, is sort of the, the legal right to do this. And it's, it's one of these things, and, it, and it's one of many things, I think, that, that, we've, that we've seen that have been norms, yeah. that, um, that no, one, like, no one thought you had to pass a law that says, don't do this. Um, but, <laughs> but here we are. Um, and maybe we do. <laughs> um, so there hadn't been heretofore a, you know, a specific you know, piece of legislation preventing it. So there hadn't been, um, and so he can say, you know, I have this right to do this. But now we've got an association of federal judges holding an emergency meeting this Wednesday. Ex explain that. What and and is this as uncommon as it sounds? Right. It's it's so it's a it's a it's basically so it's a, a club of federal judges and there are about a thousand of them and they uh, and it's actually uh, the exec executive director is actually a, a federal judge who was appointed by. Um, by George W. Bush, and so, uh, you know, probably not a Democrat, um, calling for an emergency meeting of their executive committee um, to talk about what is happening with all of this, you know, you're getting into sort of pressuring on the sentencing. There's this new review happening of, of, of Michael Flynn's conviction as well. So now he's there saying, like, this is too much meddling happening mm -hmm. sort of with this, with this Justice Department, and so there's actually going to be a meeting to sort of figure out what, if anything, they can do. Uh, in response. Yeah, I mean, today the, uh, uh, Trump said that he is the nation's highest ranking law enforcement officer, which he's not, of course. The attorney general is. Um, so th there's an issue there about maybe his confusion with his own role. But, but I mean, I think this, this, <laughs> this is one thing that, that uh, you know, as Melissa said, you, we, we have to watch uh, in terms of the, these pardons. We've got Stone going to be sentenced on Thursday. Uh, he today he would not say whether he's going to pardon uh, Stone or Manafort. Uh, so these are all issues that are that are hanging out there, and I think the, the country's watching. The law enforcement uh, law enforcement is watching, and um, I think this could be a problem for him as as as, uh, as it goes forward. I'm not sure it will be. This is, this is what Trump is good at. Um, I, I I'm loath to compliment him on things, but he's good at like pushing up against these you know, norms mm -hmm. that seem kind of, uh, you know, maybe outdated or silly to, or, you know, to people, I, I think, in most of the country, or maybe that people don't 
follow this closely enough to understand why it's a norm and what the implications are of it. And, and you know, look, I, I think the stone thing is similar to Blagojevich. I, I, I think it'd be, it's crazy to put somebody in jail for nine years for, for, for lying to the feds. Uh, you know, absolutely should be held accountable. But, but the, so Trump's position is right. So he f- takes this little kernel of truth which is that you know his his buddy fixer what do we call him hitman maybe not quite a hitman <laughs> uh, gets seven to nine years and that feels like a lot and so he 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 just really digs in on that and he goes way out of bounds for what's appropriate and uh, but uh, you know in a way that you know seems more like you know, very un-American, right? That, you know, seems like something you'd read about in like an island country or something with like a president acting like this. Uh, but, but, you know, he doesn't ever quite, you know, step to the point that, that, that backlash gets created. And to be honest, he's gone through impeachment and he knows he's got a backstop in the Senate. I mean, for there sure. is no backlash he really has to worry about. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was the part voters. of the warning, yeah. well, right, about going forward with the impeachment. It's like, if you do this, I mean, there's there's sort of arguments on both sides, of course, but one argument against it was, uh, if you go through this and he survives, like we think that he will, then he's really going to feel, um, you know, free to, to act in even more egregious ways. And so this may be part of, you know, this uh, maybe newfound feeling of, hey, uh, I've sort of gotten through the fire and, you know, I've come out the other side. And in, for, for some Democrats, you know, there, I think there may be a little, I don't want to say buyer's remorse, but, you know, maybe, you know, it, it, again, they're sort of examining the, the results of this failed attempt. And, and I think, I mean, you got to look at, as you it go, goes to Tim's issue on how effective he is, um, he is addressing, you know, in rally after rally, he's getting huge numbers in his rallies. He is pumping up his base. The numbers in California, when we're talking about voting already returned in California, Republicans are ahead ahead of Democrats already, even though I think it's at 33% of the the ballots so far in are from Republicans versus uh, about 27% from Democrats. And Republicans are only 23% of the electorate here. So the, the numbers are pumped up on the Republican side here, even in California. Now, that may be because... Republicans have one candidate, and the Democrats are still deciding between many. But the fact is, what we're seeing in these rallies are are, are a very energized base that is turning out for him. And on the Democratic side, you're seeing the splintering of, of between the moderate lanes and the and the progressive lanes. And so I think Democrats have, have some worries there, watching how effective he is and watching him use these issues at his, at his rallies and his events. Okay. He's really good at it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tim, considering all this that we've been discussing, were you surprised by the announcement last week that former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe will not be prosecuted? Uh, So, again, this is another one of those issues that works to Trump's favor at these rallies, like Carla said. To be honest, I'm not a legal expert. Maybe you have, you know, legal thoughts on this. Um, I, I think that what McCabe did with his le- with the leaking and, and particularly the kind of the li- the the uh, how, how do you say it? Was it lying about his leaking? I guess so. I mean, certainly he was performative in trying to to draw attention away from the fact that it was him uh, good, going so far as to like dress down staffers about the possibility that they might have leaked something that he knew he leaked. Uh, it was very how scar- dare you scaremucci <laughs> uh, He pulled a scaremucci on that. That was scaremucci's <laughs> go- go-to move in his 13 days in the White House. Um, so is that illegal? Right? I mean, is that an FBI matter? Something that rises to having to be investigated? I, you know, I, I'll defer to the lawyers. Probably not. But that does play into Trump's hands in these things, where he says, look at this, McCabe over here. He was leaking. He gets nothing. Roger Stone, he was lying. He gets nine years. Is that fair play? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's an argument for, a legal argument for why why it landed like that, but but it allows Trump to really kind of create this and, and foster this distrust um, in in you know the federal legal system that he's done and he's done that very well. Very good. Well, let's move on to another topic. Uh, I think we've all seen the headlines in recent days, less recent weeks, I guess, really, over corruption in San Francisco's city government. Um, you know, yes, shocked, yes, shocked, but still. Um, and this centers around the arrest, the arrest of Mohammed Nuru, the former, the now former head of the city's public works department you know, the people who keep our city streets so spotless. 
Um, <laughs> he was accused for, of corruption on a number of uh, avenues, including accepting gifts and returns for helping companies uh, through the city's difficult development planning process. Now, San Francisco Mayor London Breed wrote a post on medium.com last week in which she admitted receiving a gift worth almost $6,000 last year from Mohammed Nuru in the form of some repair work on an old car she had. Uh, she also admitted 20 years ago to having had a romantic relationship with Nuru and that they had remained good friends ever since. So, Melissa, let's start with you. I mean, what do you make of this? Is this <laughs> business as usual? Is oh this, I mean, well, let, let me start with this way. There have been reports that the FBI was not after Nuru, they were after a bigger fish. So let me put it this way, is, should London Breed be scared? Well, I mean, if, it's, if that's true, if that's really the universe of it, if it's $5,600 for a car repair uh, and a 20-year-old romantic relationship, then no, uh, she ain't the fish. Um, but, but she, you know, but there could be something more that we don't know about, um, or someone else that we don't know about. I, uh, we were saying backstage, I certainly hope the feds did not spend like two years investigating a, a $5,600 car. <laughs> uh, that right. seems like a rate of return a little, a little off. Um, so, so maybe there's something else out there that we don't know about that, that's going to come out later. But if, if this really is the universe, and I felt like the, the, the romantic relationship was kind of, I don't know, maybe a MacGuffin of some sorts, like nobody cares, but, but but, but then, and yeah. it doesn't really matter, you know, it's 20 years ago, it was long before she'd ever run for office, like, mm -hmm. but all this headline, this is a media thing, like, all the headlines were, like, romantic relationship, and it's like, no, 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 I think the car thing was the money thing was <laughs> yeah, the yeah. thing, yeah, not yeah. the romantic yeah, relationship, yeah. but everyone paid attention to this one, the less important part of this Friday before a holiday, <laughs> you know, yeah, blog right, post. Right. Uh, and so it was really, you know, well done um, by by her and her team. And, and like I said, if that's all there is, then then she will probably be okay in the long term. But uh, you know, if, if that's not, you know, certainly uh, it could be her. It could be someone, someone else that they're actually trying to to build a case against. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was interesting. I, th I think her uh, medium post. She laid it out there, uh, she, uh, to her credit. I mean, this is somebody who's, who's been viewed as a rising star in the Democratic Party. She has a very interesting personal history coming up in the projects of San Francisco. Uh, so uh, I think people are watching to see how she handles this, and I think that was a, that was a good start. But, but you're absolutely right. There's still questions out there. How far does this corruption go? I have to say, uh, on Mohammed Nuru's part, I mean, as a reporter, uh, I remember for years, you know, anytime you'd call him, this is a guy who would call you right back. He'd give you information. He, he was actually like a super efficient city bureaucrat in that respect. And so, I mean, for that, and that was one of the things he did right, apparently, because when people like Rose Pack and other big, you know, power brokers here in the city would call him and say, hey, clean up the trash, uh, you know, down in Chinatown or wherever, he was there and he would do it. Uh, but the, the, the question is now, you know, what else was going on? And that's the question with... Mayor Breed, um, she is the city, the, the country's highest paid mayor. And, you know, why is she driving an 18-year-old car and having somebody, you know, pay her, her, her car repair? That's sort of the question there. And I think, the, uh, yes, bigger fish in San Francisco isn't there always. Uh, you know, remember, the FBI, as we were talking about, for years was looking into Willie Brown, never found anything. Um, but they've, this has always been a town where drama has been lurking under the surface when it comes to politics. I, I just, I, I don't know the details behind the scenes. I really hope that's all this is. I don't want to give her the kiss of death, so you don't take it out here for being complimented by a Republican. But <laughs> London <laughs> seems like the only non-insane person in all of <laughs> San Francisco <laughs> politics. And so uh, if, she, if she goes down for this, I'd be very <laughs> concerned about who would be succeeding. <laughs> I don't think it would be a Jeb Bush Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, KGO radio host John Rothman said yesterday that with Nuru facing 25 years in prison, possibly, he has plenty of reasons to sing. Um, <laughs> one thing I, I, I've seen other people kind of bring up the, the uh, accusations that have been lodged against uh, London Breed back in the, do you remember the Shrimp Boy scandal? And this was uh, the accusations that she had been paid with uh, untraceable debit cards in order for her, in return for her help with various you know city contract work. Should we put? I mean, I'll start with Melissa. I mean, any validity or anything, any weight we can put on these shrimp boy accusations? Well, if shrimp boy says it, <laughs> then you can just take that to the, to the bank. bank. <laughs> 
I mean, look, I'm not saying it's a, it's not possible, but I'm just saying we don't have any uh, any evidence beyond Shrimp Boy's statements uh, that this is true. And of course, if there is, and I'm sure it gets uncovered and becomes made public, like that's that's a very different story. But right now, all we have are the statements of uh, of someone named Shrimp Boy. So there you go. That's all. That's all there is to that at this point, but it, and it doesn't sound, I'll just say this as somebody who, um, and I think Carla can, can weigh in on this too, as somebody who's sort of watched her for years, it just doesn't sound like necessarily the kind of thing that she would do. Yeah. It just doesn't. And I'm not saying she's an angel from heaven. I'm just saying it just it doesn't have the ring of truth to it, uh, you know, necessarily. Well, if anything happens, she'll get pardoned by the president. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the 2020 campaign and from our very scientific uh, polling here of people who sent forward some cards, Mike Bloomberg is ahead. Mm, well. Okay. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, have, we have some folks who, who said Bernie, someone said Amy, but Bloomberg, Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, Mike, I'm behind Mike. Um, let's get into the 2020 race, the, uh, what we've, we're seeing in the caucuses and primaries so far. But let's start off with Bloomberg, Carla. I mean, I've been watching him and going to his events here in California. They're, they're impressive in that he has hired some major people on in California uh, who, run, who know how to run campaigns. The folks who are showing up at his events um, are you know, very thoughtful people who are saying, look, um, I just want somebody who can beat Trump. And maybe you know, I wasn't with him in the beginning, but he's looking to me like the guy who has the muscle and the willingness to do that. Um, I, I have to say that you know he's, got, he's splitting right now the moderate lane with Amy and with Pete Buttigieg, who I also just watched in, in, in the Bay Area here and in uh, Central Valley this week. I also got good crowds. But the uh, latest PPIC poll, which just came out about an hour and a half ago, uh, has tells a totally different story. Sanders has a double digit lead, 32 uh, against, uh, be, ahead of Biden at 14, that's the closest, Warren at 13, Bloomberg at 12, so he's come up quite a bit, <clears throat> and Buttigieg at 12. So the fact is, Bernie's got the progressive lane all to himself in California. I just saw him yesterday in Richmond. He had 10,000 people there. Um, and these are like believers. They are not people who are like, I'm shopping around. I got to find the... No, they're with him. And a lot of them are like, I'm not sure who, if I'm going to vote for anybody else if it's not Bernie. Yeah, I don't think anyone has ever said... I might vote for Bernie. I don't really know. Probably. No, no. no. Hey, this, Most of these people in about five months, I yeah. think, are going to be yeah. saying that. Well, according to the week-to-week -week poll, this is a Bloomberg crowd. Yeah, so, no. Yeah. I mean, it, so, so I think on the, on the Bloomberg oh. side, it's been fascinating to watch him in California. He's done events in the Central Valley. He's going for picking up a whole bunch of those delegates in the Central Valley. But the, we had about 20-something uh, House districts that voted for Trump last time around. There's delegates available. This, this primary is like 53 different states. Uh, you have to you get 15% of the vote. Uh, all of these uh, House districts have delegates up for grabs. There's 494 in California altogether. People are already voting. And Bloomberg is out there telling people, vote early. They're he, he wants to bank those vote. So uh, he's got a strategy going. The, the, the question is, uh, is he going to be able to beat Sanders, who more and more after Nevada is looking more and more uh, like it could be uh, hard to catch up to him? Um, I, I, I guess my question for all the Mike fans out there is, is you know, what more does Pete have to do to get y'all on board? I mean, he's a nice <laughs> young man. <laughs> You know, age, when, uh, about 15 uh, years. Age. Uh, okay, I he won Iowa. He finished second in New Hampshire. And, and you know, it's just uh, he can't pick up steam. I guess it must maybe if it was four years from now or eight years from now, maybe that would be different. But in a different time, you know, look at, if you look back at 08, right, Obama was a young man, uh, won Iowa, second in New Hampshire. And, and about this time in 07, uh, you know, I was working for McCain at the time, Oh, you could just feel everybody looking at Obama and saying, that's our guy. And that just, for some reason, hasn't happened for Pete, um, which I think is too bad because, man, Bloomberg and Bernie and Trump is just like a nightmare of choices for somebody like me. Um, <laughs> it's just hard to even 
<laughs> grab, like trying to think of another person that would be in the bottom, that would that would break that bottom three for options. Yeah, don't um, worry, Tulsi Gabbard is still uh, in. Tulsi, I guess, there you go. Tulsi, I guess, would probably break, it, break in. Um, <laughs> Uh, ahead of Bloomberg, but yeah, no, look, you're right. I, I just, I, I, boy, I, I think Bloomberg. I am very concerned. Bloomberg has a glass jaw. Um, I'm having uh, big time PTSD from 2016 um, <laughs> with with Trump. Uh, you know, if you look at the poll, Carla said. I mean, all this stuff is happening. Jeb dropped out after South Carolina. Two days later, I joined a, a pack called Our Principles Pack. Uh, this is a fun little Veep-esque anecdote for you guys. Uh, there were about 20 of us that worked for our principles pack, which was a Republicans Against Trump pack. Every single person involved in it, except for me and one other woman, uh, uh, ended up supporting Donald Trump in the general election. So our principles were kind of, eh. <laughs> our principles-ish. But, um, the but, Susan Collins. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, so basically what happened is when I started right after South Carolina, uh, we, we were trying to get people on board, you know, the big, big Republican names, donors, politicians. And what they were saying to me was, well, let's just kind of see how it plays out in a couple of weeks. So, you know, I'm not too sure who to go for yet, Marco or Ted or Kasich. And, you know, let's just give it a little bit of time. And I'm not too worried about it yet. And then about three weeks later, Donald Trump was the presumptive nominee. And I was like, what about now? And they were like, <laughs> well, looks like he's going to be the pre You know, looks like he's going to be the nominee. Don't want to get on the wrong side of him. And so you see that happening yeah. with Bernie. Look, yeah. Obama's are nowhere. Clinton's nowhere. Pelosi nowhere. Reid nowhere. Big Democratic donors nowhere. Everybody's just kind of sitting on the sidelines saying, well, let's see how it plays out. Maybe Biden, yeah. maybe Bloomberg. Right. By the time Bernie wins California, this thing is over. And, and, and all of those folks are going to have to get on board with him. Um, it is the exact mm -hmm. same thing that happened in 2016. And I just, look, Mike Bloomberg, uh, we can go deeper on why I don't like him if you want. Uh, he's fine. I guess he's better than Bernie or Trump. But um, I worry he's actually helping uh, Bernie for, the, for this reason. You know, a lot, a lot of folks are, are supporting somebody that really doesn't have a chance. And they're dividing up the, the center I, I right. Think, I think the interesting, center left, thing, I mean. the interesting thing to look at with Bernie's numbers in this poll tonight uh, he's definitely getting the younger voters, and I, you could see that in this rally yesterday. Uh, you know, the voter under 44, he has 54 percent. Women, he's getting 40 percent. Men, 28 percent. Latinos, 53 percent. This is really important. This is where we get to uh, Pete Buttigieg and why he hasn't, you know, without the African-American vote and the Latino vote in yeah. California, you're nowhere. And, this, and what the shocking thing about the way this California primary is playing out is, where is Joe Biden? It's crickets. We're not seeing anything with him. And Amy Klobuchar, as much as she has, has gotten some excitement coming out of New Hampshire, and so forth, has no ground game here. Uh, you know, she's doing one fundraiser here this week, but uh, and she's raised some money. A lot of people like her, but she doesn't have the apparatus here. And this is where Bloomberg, you know, he's hiring on these people that know the state up and down. Yeah, he was saying, I, I'm, I'm going to ignore Iowa and, and New yeah. Hampshire. And, 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 and he's got now, uh, you know, like mayors endorsing him up and down the Central Valley. Uh, in little towns, which you never think would be matter, all of a sudden they do matter because these are all districts where he can pick up uh, delegates. So that's, how much is a mayor endorsement going for? I, I like I'm here, like twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> it's like crazy the amount of money. And that is the one other difference with the Bloomberg events. You go there and it's like massive buffet, free, and you know they're giving away T-shirts and everything. And this is the kind of stuff that you do not see in the other. But I, I just think for a lot of Democrats, like the idea that you're going to have to choose between Sanders and Trump, is kind of terrifying. Um, you know, and so it's not so much that people are like, yay, Mike. It's like, well, he looks sane and <laughs> <laughs> he's made a lot of money. Maybe he's not dumb. So, OK. And so fine. You know, like and now he's under the microscope. And so the question is, can you survive now? The mm -hmm. scrutiny? Because he's mm -hmm. been in public life so long. So I think even for some Bloomberg supporters, they're like, is there going to be like a Hollywood access tape? What? You know, like, is there going to be like a weirdo recording that's going to come out? that We're going to be like, eh. And so we're seeing the recordings come out. Right. Um, and so how much can we stand? Um, really? And it can still be like, fine. Um, uh, but because e there, there are all kinds of possibilities, uh, even like a third party uh, run, maybe, or some sort of somebody trying to jump on the libertarian you know, yeah, uh, it's just part of the ticket. But I mean, there's lots of there's lots of possibilities. If it comes down to Trump versus Sanders, I think there are a lot of people who are going to feel left out on the left and the right by that. I, I just want to throw out maybe not here uh, in this room. Or maybe there are some people in this room. I don't know. But I think that there are going to be a lot of people feeling left out by Trump versus Bloomberg. 
Uh, I, I, like Bloomberg, you, a lot of times we think Trump changed the dynamics of, of the way we should think about our kind of political spectrum um, from, you know, basically my birth and I guess, well, should I age myself? Sure. 81 <laughs> through 2016, uh, which is kind of this sort of Reagan, you know, right. And then, you know, sort of right. liberal, you know, whatever, however you want to say it, Mondale to Clinton left um, spectrum. I, Trump blew that up and this and the left to right spectrum is important, but so is the up to down spectrum. And there were a lot of people on the bottom of the spectrum who who kind of did feel left out, didn't like Bush or Clinton, didn't like, you know, um, uh, right, Reagan or mm -hmm. Mondale or whatever. And they came out for Trump. Now, those. Bloomberg isn't bringing back any of those people. Bl Bloomberg is like the personification of what they hate. He wants to take their guns. He wants to take their big gulps. He's a he's a billionaire who has <laughs> seriously he is a billionaire who's having a you know catered lunches for people that he's like trying owns, to buy the election. Media. So you know I I, I, get, I hear what you're saying. I, I agree with you I'm, there. I'm, just saying, no. I'm not I'm not denying why people like Sanders. What I'm yeah. saying is if you ask why. And there may be some very pro Mike folks, but I mean, why do people like Mike Bloomberg? It's because of who he's not as much as who he is. Right. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, I, it's just shocking me that the Democrats couldn't find somebody that could even kind of bridge that up and down well, okay. outside so, yeah. of the scale. Because because yeah. Bloomberg, as many people as Bernie alienates, Bloomberg's alienating an equal or greater amount that are of just different kinds of Democrats. But to Carla's yeah. point, that's why it's so shocking that Biden, who was supposed yeah. to right, Biden one, could have been the one that could have bridged. Left. You and know, he was the Elizabeth working class, Warren, who, you know, Pittsburgh. Who, who, in our, in the sure. last poll here was was had a third of the vote, basically even with Sanders and Biden. So for some reason, why, how, how did that happen where she just she just collapsed and her supporters are going to over to Bernie? Yeah. Um, that, that That's what's happening now. So, yeah, we're certainly in the circular firing squad portion of the yes. uh, primary. You although, mentioned Pete. Sorry, go ahead. Although um, so. But to Carla's point about uh, Mike Bloomberg having a great operation. So I don't know how many of y'all saw um, when I interviewed Rick Wilson. Um, who uh, wrote this really hilarious book. Uh, and and he, we had him talking about sort of what Democrats should do to beat Trump. And he said, you know, you need to call him fat, call him poor, call him, you know, like call him, you know, all these. And then the other day, and then there's like this little Twitter back and forth where the president tweeted something mean about Mike Bloomberg and Mike Bloomberg hit right back and was like, I live in New York. I, we know the same people and they mm -hmm, laugh at you behind mm -hmm. your back. They know you inherited millions and you squandered it because you're stupid. And I, and I was like, yes, Rick Wilson. Yes. Like somebody read the Brick Wilson book. <laughs> like he's actually doing, he's actually doing the stuff that at least, and who knows if it'll succeed or not. But the the, the somebody no. like Rick Wilson is saying, here's what you have to do. Here's how you attack him. And you know why other candidates aren't aren't jumping on board. I don't no, know. No, you're actually right. And that's, the people who are showing up at his events are saying that that uh, they like that. You know, he's calling him a big fat orange, whatever. Uh, you know, he's going right to it. He's not afraid of him. And uh, and Trump on Twitter. Clearly doesn't want to face Bloomberg. Keeps calling him Mini Mike, you know that kind of thing. He's he's after him a lot. Meanwhile, so he's he's sticking up for Bernie Sanders. He's the Democrats. They're really screwing Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And, and he's and, going. I know. really don't want to run against Bernie Sanders. And then you're like, <laughs> is that the briar patch you don't want to be thrown into? Because it feels like <laughs> yeah. that's not the up. That's yeah. not the truth. Well, let's, uh, let's yeah. get let's get into some of the Bernie stuff in a moment. But I just wanted to stick with uh, Bloomberg for a moment first. Um, uh, you talked about Pete Buttigieg, and, and here in San Francisco, uh, his event was disrupted by a group that calls itself Queers Against Pete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, for all I yeah. know, that group has existed <laughs> yeah, yeah. for. Right, right. No. <laughs> he, that group might have been around for like three decades, but they finally found their purpose, right? <laughs> okay, so you, you have the, like I said, the circular firing, firing squad. Yeah. With, with Mike Bloomberg, it is. These these old uh, audio files are, are coming up. Some of them not so old. Um, on him talking about stop and frisk, uh, about uh, his comments about and to women. Uh, well, there was one that yeah. just came out today or yesterday, and I forget what it was about. But I mean, so these things are coming out. I want to go to you, Tim. If you were running a campaign against him, are these the things you would target, or are there? you know, other things that, that would break his glass. Jar. Yeah, I mean, the pro part of the problem is that nobody has enough money to run a real ad campaign against him right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the only person with enough money is Bernie. And if I'm sitting in Bernie's headquarters right now, I'm like, 
let's let Mike run for a couple more weeks, you know, because as long as Mike and Biden and Pete are all in there, then I've got smooth sailing. So Bernie's the only one that could do it. It, uh, you know, and we'll see what happens tomorrow night. Uh, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if, if Pete um, and Amy and Biden go after him on that stuff. I, I, I mean, the, the Mike Oppo book is endless, you know, so uh, if it was me, I'd just tell, ask my pollster, which, like, <laughs> which, which one's the best? Yeah. I don't know which one to pick. I, I got so many favorites here. Uh, you know, I mean, he's in the bag for Wall Street. He, he's got the womanizing stuff. He's got the comments on uh, uh, transgender. Uh, he's got the comments on minorities. Uh, I, he has a lot of issues with with what is um, kind of in vogue in, in the Democratic base. I mean, if those queers are against Pete, uh, imagine what they think about Mike. <laughs> not not good. Right. Um, so uh, you know, I mean, B Bloomberg, and or maybe it's just as simple as uh, the fact that Mike Bloomberg supported George W. Bush in two thousand four. I like George W. Yeah, Bush. He was. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I like George I mean, W. Bush, but know, is that really where the they, Democratic Party is right now? But they, they, uh, they, it doesn't look like it's. But then you got to think about the, the, the circular firing squad that is the Democratic Party right now. You talk about queers for Pete at, at Bernie's rally. There were, I'm not kidding you, topless vegans that were uh, that were protesting <laughs> Bernie there. Okay, so it's like. Wait, hold on. <laughs> on which side? <laughs> what were they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what were they upset I mean, about? I mean, the Democratic the Party. Vegan party. Yeah. <laughs> has, has he come out against? Sure. Vegan I didn't quite like get the. But but the bottom line is, you know, it's kind of looking like a freak show mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And the Democrats have got to get whatever message they've got together. As you said, I think tomorrow <clears> night on that stage, we're going to see is Bloomberg going to be able to take the heat? He's not a great retail candidate. I have seen that. He's kind of stiff and not. But I, and talking to Democratic consultants and some very uh, veteran ones, they're saying, look, the guy was uh, mayor of New York for three terms. He's been through all the, you know, he's been through it all. Yeah, is he going to have some bad quotes out there? He is, but, you know, it, it doesn't relate to how bad Trump's is. And, it, and, and whether you can, we, it's all about whether you can energize that base to get out for him. We will see like, tomorrow night. But the, that debate stage is really something else. I mean, yeah. it is not like anything else in politics. And I, I know that a New York mayor, you take some heat. But, uh, you know, when I was briefing Jeb for that first debate, like, he felt like he wasn't that worried about yeah. it. You know, he's like, I'm a Bush. We've yeah. seen all these debates yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a new, new time you yeah, know trump's yeah. out there the cameras you know you got no, 12 people no. up there uh, uh it's and you know if everybody's aiming their fire on them all these other guys have had 11 warm-up debates yeah We'll yeah. I mean, if he does well tomorrow, he probably w that will probably be it. He'll yeah. consolidate the anti-Bernie. Yes. But I, I think that that he's going to be in for a little more than he bargained for tomorrow night. OK, well, speaking of some of the anti-Bernie stuff we have seen, uh, we've seen uh, someone dredged up an article he wrote back in the, I think, early 70s in which he made some non-family friendly comments about uh, women and rape fantasies. Um, there was a video of his. Uh, where after he had returned from a visit to the Soviet Union, uh, praising the Soviet system and their wonderful yes. architecture and, and programs and such. Um, great arts programs. Yes. The Soviet Union yes. has got a lot of great arts programs. Very good. No billionaires and millionaires, but their arts programs are top notch. So Democrats, some Democrats are worried that he'll be the Jeremy Corbyn of the Democratic Party. Um, that, and that we know what happened yeah, to, yeah. to them in an election that potentially was winnable, and they they massively lost. That know. comparison has been made, the Jeremy Corbyn um, comparison. And I have to say that one of the one of the stranger things about the whole Bernie phenomenon, I think, is um, the, the the passion and the um, I mean, it's almost like it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I was telling you guys backstage. That uh, you know, I covered this Bernie rally. We put a lot of video out about the 10,000 people there. There, I made one comment about the horrible traffic that was at this rally, and I have I had gotten 3,000 comments of like the most insulting comments from the Bernie people. They hate it when you criticize their candidate, it, and it is this has become kind of a thing, the Bernie Bros. But it really is it really is a, a phenomenon with that candidate, and. Um, I mean, on one hand, that's going to energize these people to get out there. On the other hand, uh, when some of these stories start coming out, um, th they are really relentless on media uh, when when there's any kind of critical story. And this happened to me has happened to me a couple of times. They're, they're awful. Yeah, uh, I don't. We don't need to spend much more time on it, but they're awful. I, I, these stories, I, you know, look, certain candidates have an ability 
to just transcend these sorts of things. Trump had it. You know, Obama had it. You couldn't stick anything to Obama, yeah. right? Um, maybe Bernie has it. I, we'll have to see. You know, he hasn't had a very concerted campaign come at him from the right. You know, Hillary tried this thing where they, she attacked him for the left on guns and immigration. And, you know, uh, that's a different beast than, than having somebody come at you from the right with all of this, you know, the old Russia oppo. But, uh, but maybe, <laughs> folks, just maybe the combination of Trump being the other option and Bernie's, you know, this sort of yeah. crazy kind of base he has allows him to transcend it. I don't know. This str it's just, it's very strange. The thing that I don't have a lot of expertise on that I'm trying to wrap my head around, maybe somebody will, can answer this on a card, is like, we are in a very stable t time in the country. Like, as stable as in this last century, right? And so it's, it's interesting that we have these two radically disruptive candidates that are going to end up leading the two parties at a time when unemployment's low, when there's not really any major national... I mean, there are some national security threats, but nothing compared to most of the last century. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's... The, the question is, if, if at a time of such stability, people are turning to Bernie, are they really going to care what he said about the Sandinistas in the 70s? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's more probably the effect is more, not necessarily on like the people already committed, you know, very, you know, sort of enthusiastically. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's for people who are going to sit there and go, if it's really Trump versus Sanders, can I stomach a vote for Sanders. Mm -hmm. And that's who I think that is aimed at, not at his enthusiastic supporters, but the people who are like, all right, let me just think this through. Mm -hmm. Let me think through what it's going to be like on election day. When I look down and these are the electors I've got, um, it are, are the people who would be Mike Bloomberg supporters or people who are supporting the other candidates. Um, it, you know, that kind of thing I think is aimed at keeping them at home. Not that they're going to vote for Trump, right? But it's about keeping sure. people not voting at all. On that positive note, uh, let's go into our <laughs> final topic, which once again involves President Donald Trump. In this case, uh, the Trump administration is sending in ICE agents to cities, the sanctuary cities, such as San Francisco, New York, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, uh, to apparently deal with immigration issues. Um, is this a... We were talking about this behind the, the before the program in the green room, and you know it's being played up as a as a dramatic thing, but it also kind of sounds like an argument can be made that it's not. I'm looking at you, Melissa. Um, <laughs> I'm if you could explain. I mean, there. What are, what can we expect from this? Maybe start there. Well, so there are a couple things potentially happening here. He does sometimes gin up controversy. Um, he could also be sending additional agents up into. Uh, sanctuary cities. But as we were talking backstage, uh, last time I checked, and it's been a few months, but uh, for example, the sheriff of San Francisco, if you go in and you type in a name of someone you are looking for, it will tell you when the next hearing date is for that person. And this is useful for families, for example, who want to know when they can see their loved one who's got a hearing coming up or, um, or other folks, but it's a public thing. And so if you had enough people to sit around and go to every hearing and wait for the hearing when they get released, <laughs> um, then you could take, you know, the ICE agents could take someone into custody. So in that way, it is um, deploying more folks um, from ICE could result in more, um, you know, in more people being taken into custody. So that's one way you could do it. But, but it's not like they're going to, it doesn't sound to me like we're going to see them, you know, prowling the streets or, you know, doing patrols. Um, it sounds like maybe just more manpower to, to go through and kind of, you sit at the hearings, basically, or go down to the courthouses and, and try to take people into custody, which which could be real. Yeah. Uh, but, he, but he is oh. using it. I mean, uh, he went after uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti today on Twitter, uh, basically saying, you know, this is uh, this is unlawful, this is illegal, we, uh, we can't have this. And the, may the mayor basically trying to reassure people that, you know, teams of, of, uh, of uh, law enforcement agents aren't going to come sweeping through their communities and start grabbing up people. Um, you know, th this kind of back and forth with California and with Gavin Newsom, he's going to be giving his state of the state address tomorrow. I assume we're going to be hearing from the governor on this as well. This has just been a long running issue uh, about safety of communities. And we know what, you know, how sanctuary cities, what, what, what the local officials have said, look, it makes people safer when they know they can go to, go to law enforcement and report crimes. 
uh, but we, you know, we have these high profile cases like the Kate Stanley case here in San Francisco, uh, like the one in Los Angeles, which he's, he's going to have uh, the family member there tomorrow. So I think um, this isn't going to end. I think it, 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 it just goes to the, an issue that works with his base. Uh, and 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 he'll continue to uh, yeah. to pound this thing. I think it's just about fear and politics. You know, it sounds good to to his base. It sounds good to swing voters. Really, it sounds good, especially if Bernie's ends up being the nominee. This is the this is where the battleground is going to be. These working class white voters, um, they're with Trump on immigration, uh, and so I, I think it's about politics and, and there's, it's about fear. Uh, you know, I think that his Trump is a lot is 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 as much talking to immigrants and asylees and refugees right. and their family members and letting them know that he's cracking down on them as he is actually doing it. Um, and, and so I think it serves those two purposes. I have mentioned numerous times in this program that I'm from Wisconsin and Wisconsin and California and I think maybe in other state, Minnesota, are the main states for resettlement for among refugees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that we all, I remember in grade school, our teachers just taking us aside and explaining these new students we're going to see around us and such. Um, and now there are reports of fear really spreading right. throughout those communities because uh, the Trump administration is talking about sending them back. Um, yeah, and, we, and we're gonna say, I mean, this is happening at the time the census is, is starting also yeah. in California. There's a definite impact there. And I've talked to officials here. Remember, uh, if people don't answer the door, uh, the potential is to cost California millions of dollars uh, and, and potentially congressional representation. And officials are very concerned because even though the, that citizenship quest, question does not make it into the census uh, because of the courts, uh, the, feel, the fear is already there among immigrant communities now. Uh, so this only sends yet another message as the census is going on in California, and that's got to concern officials here. Yeah, we actually had a program here at the club a few weeks ago on the census and the city folks who were you know, working on ensuring that we get a high turnout right. or a high reply rate. And I guess you can this year actually fill out the census online. So um, more on that, I guess we'll be seeing a lot. Um, some questions from the audience before we get to the news quiz. A couple of people wrote about the uh, billionaire thing we were talking about. And if I can find the right card here, it was, this is my favorite. Can a real oligarch oust a faux oligarch? <laughs> Which is a great question, I love it, but from what you were saying, Tim, the full oligarch is the one who has that actual real connection with the people on the bottom. It's the one thing I regret the most about our efforts against him in 2016 was not was focusing too much on his behavior and not enough about the economic, you know, the people that he'd screwed over who were uh, uh, vendors to him and who worked at his casinos. And I think that would have worked better. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I, I worry that Bloomberg um, role, real oligarchness plays into the hands of both Bernie and Trump in a way that that, that makes it tough for him. Yeah. Uh, someone else writes, after Iowa, is the caucus system on its way out? If you remember the <laughs> Iowa okay. caucus debacle with their, uh, their yeah. really super cool app. Yeah. No, I mean, Bella? I think Democrats understand the insanity of this, that whole system. Uh, every, particularly, you know, when you, here we are in California, we've got you know, 10 times the number of delegates in Iowa. To, and, and going out to the Central Valley this week, I, I talked to lifelong Democrats out there who said this was the first time they'd ever seen a presidential candidate in their lifetime. Uh, it was uh, seeing Buttigieg in, in, in Turlock. I mean, and, and yet in Iowa, these, these people are in their living rooms for 20 times. I think that people understand that's unfair. Uh, but not, but not only that, the caucus system itself, the idea of having to show up at seven o'clock and spend three hours, uh, and, and of course, like working people, parents, um, disabled people cannot, ha do not have a role in this situation. I, I think the Democrats got, I hope got the message this time around. Um, and Nevada is trying to sort of tailor the system now. They can vote a little bit early, but the fact is these caucus systems require a huge investment of time. They're not fair. And uh, it's time to move the system around and, and to change the, the, the states in terms of which ones get early attention. Um, you know, California just gets screwed every time on this. We don't get to see these candidates except on television. But, but, but remember, too, I mean, there's, like, so Iowa did actually have a regular primary, and they, and they stopped 
Um, and one reason went back to the caucuses actually because it uh, worked too well. Uh, <laughs> well, remember <laughs> this. Okay, so a caucus is funded by the party. It is run by the party. That's why it gets to be five and a, and a half billion hours long, and it's why you get to electioneer in the room. Like you could never do that at a polling place, right? They, they have actual sort of precinct captains for each candidate who stands up and like gives a little speech and like tries to get everybody. It's like a high school class president kind of thing. Um, they get they get their little speech and then people vote with their feet. Um, and it's kind of like ranked choice voting because like you go to your corner, you're like, all right, I'm Andrew Yang. And uh, and if you don't meet a certain threshold, you're called not viable. So they're like, all right, well, Yang supporters, you're not viable. And so they go, okay. And then they can go to another candidate's corner. So like, all right, I'm going to go stand in the Elizabeth Warren corner. And so you actually get to, you know, they sort of eliminate the um, not viable candidates until they get, uh, until people get there. So there's sort of a, a ranked choice voting part of this. So what you have to do in Iowa, at a place like Iowa, isn't just to say, oh, hey, let's do an election. You actually then have to go to the state legislature and get them to fund it because those state elections with like booths and people working them and ballots uh, and machines, that is all, uh, that, that's all going to be funded by someone um, and probably the state. Now, they might do it um, just because it would be such a huge economic loss if they, uh, if the, if the parties threatened them with their first in the nation status. I mean, this is really a lot of a lot of where um, you know their their it, revenue comes from every four years. So that might be enough pull, but it it takes more than just the party saying, "All right, enough of these census, enough of these um, these caucuses. Uh, we got to make a change." There's a lot of other moving parts that have to yeah. go with it. I think it's done on the Democratic side. I just do. Um, and uh, New Hampshire's done a better job of maintaining its status. Uh, the Republicans, uh, governors are Republican, legislatures are Republican, uh, evangelical, a uh, high population in Iowa. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's going to be tougher to move them off that on our on, on my former team side, my quasi team side, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Okay. Well, last question before we get to the news quiz, so we'll keep it short. Someone writes, Bill Barr, the Attorney General, won't resign. Should Pelosi impeach? Mm. Oh, oh. I think she has the appetite for that. Uh, I mean, I, I think that probably Trump gets reelected and, 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 and we do go through the impeachment process again uh, with him over something. I, I think your joke at the top was... Probably more than a joke. I, I don't think that they'll impeach Barr. Uh, and you're only going to get a worse attorney general after Barr. Honestly, everyone has gotten worse than the first. Who would have uh, thought Jeff Sessions <laughs> would have been the standard bearer of attorney generals? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that ended up Jared turning out Kushner well. Jared will be a good attorney general. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, I would like to answer the question I got, though, which was, how can you be a Republican <laughs> with that hair? <laughs> I'm going through a midlife crisis, okay? <laughs> so if everybody could just leave me alone, <laughs> let me go through my midlife okay. crisis, that'd be nice. Uh, thank you to our great panel today, Carla Marinucci, Tim Miller, and Melissa King. Thanks to all of you here in the room and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great rest of your week, and don't forget to vote. Don't forget to vote is right.